بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم لك الحمد حق حمدك كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد السلام عليكم It is my great pleasure and honor to address this esteemed gathering at the 2019 Mass ICNA Convention and I want to begin by thanking and acknowledging the efforts of our organizers and the tireless efforts that you have poured into this wonderful convention. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you. Now on the topic of the legacy that we leave behind, how many of us in this room under the age of 40 have thought about our legacy? How many of us have thought about what we will leave behind? How we will be remembered, the impact of our actions on those around us, and if and how we have contributed to our communities. What does it mean, my dear brothers and my dear sisters, to have a legacy? What does it mean to leave something behind? We often think of legacy in terms of legacy planning, estate planning, drawing up a will, establishing a bequest or a trust, appointing an executor, directing a portion of what we leave behind to our favorite charitable organization. Our end-of-life planning, for example, may even extend to drawing up a power of attorney and expressing our wishes about the quality of care we'd like to receive or who we trust to make critical health care decisions on our behalf. We may even have had conversations with our spouse or children about how we would like them to handle certain decisions on our behalf, how we would like them to handle our many worldly possessions. All of those things we spent a lifetime accumulating never to be able to take any of them with us into the grave. Think about that. A lifetime of accumulation and consumption. But to what end? All of those things that we had to have because we thought they would make us happier people or better people or smarter people. If only we knew how many of those things would end up dispersed among our relatives to argue about, left in a thrift store drop box, or dumped on the curb to end up in a garbage truck. Objects to which we attached so much value in our lifetime. Objects that we spent considerable funds purchasing. Objects upon which we expended ample time and energy, and then what? For them to end up in piles or boxes in storage somewhere, giving our loved ones a massive headache. Dear brothers and dear sisters, our legacy is not about the objects that we manage to accumulate or the wealth that we sort of gained or achieved or financial capital. Our legacy is about an entirely different kind of capital. Number one, communal. Number two, spiritual. Number three, intellectual. Number four, emotional. And number five, human. All of these types of capital are defined as the true measure of what we leave behind when we die. The Prophet wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him, reminds us that everything comes to an end except that which reverberates through succeeding generations yielding ongoing goodness and khair. عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إذا مات الإنسان انقطع عنه عمله إلا 
من ثلاثة إلا من صدقة جارية أو علم ينتفع به أو ولد أو ولد صالح يدعو له. When a man dies, his deeds come to an end, except for three. Continuous charity, knowledge by which people derive benefit, and a pious child who prays for him. The point is, we only have a finite amount of time in which to act. We have no guarantee that the good deed we are putting off until 10 years from now I'll make hajj when I'm old, for example, or I'll put on hijab when I'm more mature, or I'll start praying after college. Again, we have no guarantee that this good deed that we're putting off, the charity we've postponed for tomorrow, will even be possible. Is our next moment even guaranteed? Do not let this life pass you by, and you have been robbed of the opportunity to do good deeds because you are distracted by the temptations of this world and the myriad inventions that have devoured our time, impeded our cognitive abilities, and decreased our attention spans, while inducing in our generation, and especially our youth, a terrible sort of anxiety and debilitating depression. So act, and act with intention purpose and clarity. Do good in the short term and in the long term, and invest in actions that will yield ongoing benefit for humanity and eternal recompense for you. And if you're wondering what that looks like, here's more counsel from our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam. Abu Huraira, reported that the Messenger of God, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Verily, among the good deeds that will join a believer after his death are these, knowledge which he taught and spread, a righteous child he leaves behind, a copy of the Qur'an he leaves for inheritance, a mosque he has built, a house he built for travelers, a well that he dug, and charity distributed from his wealth while he was alive and well, these deeds will join him after his death. An Abi Hurairah radiallahu an, qala, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna mimma yalhaq al-mu'min min amalih wa hasanatih ba'da mawsihi ilman allamahu wa nasharah wa waladan salihan tarakahu wa, mus- wa mushafan warrathahu أو مسجد أو مسجدا بناه أو بيتا لابن السبيل بناه أو نهرا أجراه أو صدقة أخرجها من ماله في صحته وحياته يلحقه من بعد موته. So look at all of the opportunities that abound to shape your legacy now. In these hadith, the Prophet peace and blessings be upon him identifies areas in which we can make a positive imprint on the lives of those around us. For in all of these deeds is spiritual benefit for the giver and the receiver. And what is the common thread in all of this? The emotional capital that is created. And ultimately, this is what a good legacy looks like. Not all of us will have children or grandchildren to pray for us. But God willing, there will be others who will remember you well and make supplication or dua for you because of how you reached out to them and touched their lives. Not all of us will leave behind the resources to build a mosque or establish a school, but even those dollar bills that you put in the donation box instead of wasting on the vending machine will count for you at the final reckoning. And look around you as you walk outside this lecture hall. Stop and speak to the volunteers at the amazing relief organizations represented here today. Don't just take their flyers and toss them in the recycling bin. Look at the faces of those children on those flyers. Pray for them. Not a single person in this room should leave today without making a sincere intention to sign up to support an orphan. 
There was a reason why our beloved Prophet was left bereft of both father and mother as a child. It was to make him a mercy to all of the worlds. For when one has experienced hardship, one is able to show mercy to those in need. If we love him, as I know all of us do, then let's express that love by supporting an orphan today. Let it be part of your legacy on the Day of Judgment that there will be orphans that will come and speak on your behalf and say that brother or sister in America who never even saw me or met me, alleviated my poverty, gave to my family, and offered me hope in a time of despair. Let that be your legacy, dear brothers and sisters, to those around you, that your actions were the source of love, support, and good cheer for those closest to you, that you are remembered well by those near and far, that the treasures you left for their hearts far outweighed the money you left in their pockets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to us in Surah An-Nahl, بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ مَا عِنْدَكُمْ يَنْفَدْ وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ بَاقَ وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّ الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا أَجْرَهُمْ بِأَحْسَنِ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ all that is with you is bound to come to an end, whereas that which is with God is everlasting. And most certainly shall we grant unto those who are patient in adversity their reward in accordance with the best that they ever did. مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَلَنُحْيِيَنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبَةً وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْرَهُمْ بِأَحْسَنِ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ And as for anyone, be it man or woman, who does righteous deeds and is a believer, him shall we most certainly cause to live a good life. And most certainly shall we grant unto such as these their reward in accordance with the best that they ever did. So my advice to all of us, beginning with myself and my sincere dua, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant all of us the capacity to begin to think about the sort of legacy we want to leave behind. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow us to reach out and leave a positive impact in the lives of those closest to us. That when we are experiencing what every soul shall experience, being lowered into that grave, and the footsteps of those who were around us are basically fading into the distance, and those angels come to us, that my dua is that with a clear conscience that we'll be able to answer those questions posed by the angels. Who is your Lord? And who was your prophet? And what was your religion? Questions that can only be answered with conviction and clarity by virtue of a life that was lived with conviction and clarity. I pray that is the legacy of all of us here today. جزاكم الله خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I want you guys to look in this room and look around you. This is the legacy of the Prophet ﷺ. We are his legacy. The masjid, the institution, the community centers. 
Everything that you see is a legacy of our Prophet When all of us are able to leave something behind that benefits humanity, not just Muslims, humanity, that's legacy. And all of us have this responsibility in our shoulder to carry the legacy of our Prophet and continue to move forward. And may Allah SWT accept all of our leaders who are leaving the legacy and the footsteps behind so that we can follow through, inshallah. I want to introduce you to our next speaker. Dr. Isam Omesh is a Libyan-American surgeon from Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. He's a former national president of Mass Students Association of U.S., Canada in early 90s. He's a former national president of Mass Muslim American Society from 2004 to 2008. He's a graduate from Georgetown University with a double degree in biology, political science, and medical doctorate. I just want to say a quick something about Dr. Islam Mamesh as my personal mentor and my leader in my community. Every time I listen to him, I can think about, and I think about a president speaking to me. So I want to welcome Dr. Islam Mamesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Hamdan Katiran Tayyiban Mubarakan Fi. Wa salatu wa salamu ala al-habib al-mustafa wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa la. On your behalf and behalf of everybody, I would like to thank the Muslim American Society and those who have made this convention happen. My brother Muhammad Kibriya and everybody who's working selflessly to make this, insha'Allah, a blessed occasion for all of us. Alhamdulillah for this. I want to share with you some thoughts, some perspective on this very important topic to all of us. Because when we think of our lives, we're thinking of the opportunity on this earth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us to be tested, to show our true colors, to carry on the mission that the prophets, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace and blessings be upon all of them. You see the concept of time and how we understand it and how we live it is very much imprinted in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in divine, in the divine guidance it provides us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in so many places in the Quran speaks directly to the purposeful life that we must lead to the very reason why we are on this earth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ do you think that you have been created in vain and that you shall not return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We always recite Surah Al-Asr when we say, Wal Asri inna al insana la fi khusr. Indeed, by time man is at loss and then it's except those who believe and do, who, those who do righteous deeds and, and so on and so forth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us and orders us when He says, Ahasib al nasu an yutraku an yakulu amanna. Do people think that they will be left idly and not be held responsible for their actions? Our Prophet وسلم, reminds us constantly when he says that your feet and the hereafter will not be allowed to proceed until you're asked about many things. Amongst them is Umruhu Fima Afna. Your livelihood, your life, what have you spent it on? Your youth and your free time, what have you used it for? Ibn Mas'ud, one of the companions, says that the thing that I feel most remorse about is a moment that passes in my life in which my ajr has not increased. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us the ultimate reward. 
that the best amongst us are those whose lives are prolonged but whose actions are also blessed and increased. So when we talk about the tradition that infuses in us this sense of urgency about our time, living life in a hurry like President Clinton says in his book, My Life, recognizing that time is not money, that life, time is life, recognizing that those fleeting moments that pass are the very account of who we are on this earth. And so the best way to leave a legacy, my dear brothers and sisters, is to live the Quranic injunctions that describes the role of man in the context of this factor of time. That you don't live a life without a purpose. That you understand that while ibadah entails everything that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that a ibadah that's not done on the right time for the right reason and in the right context is a ibadah that is less productive than the ibadah that is due to us. What the scholars say, al ibadah al-mutlaqa wa laysatu al ibadah al-muqayyada. The ibadah al-muqayyada is the one that's restricted. You think you are doing rituals, you think you are committing only that which is required in that circumstance. But al ibadah al-mutlaqa, the liberated or the freed ibadah is the ibadah that seeks the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exemplified by a deep understanding of the faith and of the condition so that it is the timely ibadah of the time so that when it's done it's done because it's needed and it's urgently needed and it's done for the very right reasons and that's how you can be true and fulfilling in the building of what you deem is your legacy align your will with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he orders you to worship him and follow his commandments the way he wishes for them to be followed. So your ta'at are the essential basis for your commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But your actions and your choices in life, what you do with the free time that you have, what you do with the energy and the wealth that you have is codified in that ultimate divine alignment of your life with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You live it in a way that starts by following his commandments for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the best that a servant can be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through what he has been ordered to do. And then it becomes a life fulfillment of doing everything that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in accordance with the dynamics that you live in. And so my dear brothers and sisters, I want to reflect on four points that talks about what are the benefits of recognizing the timely worship? What does it do to you? It allows you four things that are very essential in our lives in being able to maximize the time that we have on this earth. First, you will waste no time. You will recognize that there is no time to waste when you, when the Prophet ﷺ tells us that even remembering death increases the vitality of your ibadah, increases the contentness of your heart, and increases your ability for tawbah and for remorse. When we recognize that there are so many opportunities and we need to figure out what's more important than the important, that we have priorities, that we are to think practical and to be effective in implementing that which impacts rather than that which is most pleasing to us. You learn the second thing is to constantly push yourself to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way it pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not the way that fits your needs and your time and, and your mood and, and your choices. And so you're constantly in search of how is it that I can constantly worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, understand your mission in life. Sometimes we mix definitions when we think that Islam is a way of life. At its basic terms it is. 
It's the way we conduct ourselves. It's the way we exhibit our morals. It's the way even sometimes how we dress and how we engage. And but if you're going to just live, live Islam as a way of life, then you're not challenging yourself to live Islam as a mission in life. That everything that you have in life must be developed and geared towards the establishment of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the right place, in the, in the right context that you are responsible for figuring out and you are responsible for developing the tools by which you ensure that constant alignment. So having that timely worship reminds you to do that constantly. Thirdly, it gives you no choice but to seek where the truth is and to stand by it. Because there's no time for wiggle time. There's no time for being on the sidelines. There's no time of giving yourself the chance to think and ponder about which choice do you make when the choice about upholding justice or the choice is about helping or the choice of about sacrificing or the choice is about doing the worship that you need in order to sustain yourself in the middle of the night. That it's not a hard choice for you to do. When Brother Muhammad Kibriya asked, what would we tell our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if he was to be with us today? One of the things that I've seen constantly mentioned by those who have committed their lives for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala amongst the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is something where they say, La nuqilu wa la nastaqil. We shall not give up nor stay idle nor not take the initiative to remain at the forefront of doing everything that we know. When Abdullah ibn Rawaha was asked by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Bay'atul Aqaba Tanya, when, they, when the Prophet was making his move to establish the Islam he wants to see in a place where he has bought the commitment of its people, when he recognized that his sense of mission is moving him from Mecca, his beloved home, to a place where he can establish his mission sallallahu alayhi wasallam in Medina, there was no hesitation. But he wanted to test his partners. And so he would ask Abdullah ibn Rawaha, what? And Abdullah ibn Rawaha would understand and he would say, ask us what you expect of us, O Prophet of Allah. He said, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I expect you to believe in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never associate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, we got it, O Prophet of Allah. And for you, he said, he said for you to be my partners, to protect me from that which you protect yourself and to sacrifice for this da'wah, that which you would sacrifice for your families and your lives. We see it in another place where one of the companions was only mentioned in the seerah when Umar radiallahu anhu said, in my days, I have always wished to die the same death that this man has died. A man named Wahb ibn Qais, or Wahb ibn Qabus al-Muzani. He was a companion with them in the Battle of Uhud. When the Prophet sallallahu was faced with adversity, when the resource was scarce and when the times were scary, and they were in the midst of the battle, not knowing what the outcome of it is. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would see a group of fighters coming with arrows to attack him. And he would say, who amongst you is able to help to fend them off? And this man would jump out and say, I am O Prophet of Allah. And he would do it until they retreat. And then another group comes in with the swords trying to attack again. The group that is with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet would look to his companions and says, Who amongst you is ready to fend them off? And this man would jump again and do it. Until the tightening on the group of the Prophet Sallallahu was so much that Umar radiallahu anhu and the Sahaba were the few who were amongst them. And the Prophet would look yet one more time. And he says, Who amongst you will fend them off and I will give, promise him Jannah. And this man would jump and he would say the same word. لا نقيل ولا نستقيل يا رسول الله. And he would jump. And that was his demise. And he was even difficult for them to recognize him once this happened. 
that level of commitment is the sense that the believers have when it comes to living a life that will produce a legacy because it aligns with that which is the ultimate ideals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. The fourth point that this delivers, my dear brothers and sisters, is for us to recognize that this is not about a personal legacy. This is not about us as individuals. This is about what we stand for, what we believe in. If we claim that this divine guidance is the people's path to salvation in this life and in the hereafter, then it is high time for us to recognize that the sacrifice that's needed, that the hard work that is needed to be delivered is not something that we give just because we're good people. It is the price of this Jannah. It's a contract, it's a deal you do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you'll give up everything that you can through giving and contribution and sacrifice. So naturally that alignment brings about a legacy insha'Allah that will mimic the example of our companions when they were asked, why do you help people? Why do you feed the poor? Why do you get out of your way to, to give and to, and to help? It was very easily translated in their response. That we do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking no reward, no thanks, no gratitude, because that's not what we need. We seek something much higher. And then they say, We fear the day if which if we come short in fulfilling our responsibility, we will meet our Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a hard day. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds, فَوَقَاهُمُ اللَّهُ شَرَّ ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمُ وَلَقَّاهُمْ نَضْرَةً وَسُرُورًا وَجَزَاهُمْ بِمَا صَبَرُوا جَنَّةً وَحَرِيرًا You talk about a legacy, you need to fulfill the tenets of this deen. And that legacy will be produced inshallah naturally. My dear brothers and sisters, much to be said, but I'll tell you, in America today, this legacy of ours must translate into six points that we must be up to as a challenge. We must understand our deen and recognize the value of this divine guidance that's amongst us. Give it the time to learn it. Give it the time to make it a true implementation in your life. Secondly, you must train yourself to carry this load. That this is not a simple mission. This is not an easy task. You must build tazkiya and tarbiya. And that's why in mass it is central that we work on the self-development and in the tarbiya and so on and so forth. Thirdly, you're responsible for your own your family, your kids. If you want to build that which you believe in, translate it in the lives of your children. You must sacrifice in order to see them become the embodiment of the very values and principles that we believe in. And if you have aspirations for something bigger than you and your community, then it must be translated into the very domain that you have every responsibility to develop Fourthly, we have a community that needs to be a model community, that needs to be the carriers of this guidance. So we must work to empower and strengthen them. Fifthly, we must engage the real play, playing field for our da'wah and for our deen is not our masajid and is not just our homes, but it's rather the greater society. And when we take that, we take that with the humanity's purpose in mind. So the sixth is to take on the issues of the ummah, and to take on the human side of humanity and civilization and be the carriers that transforms America so we can address all these issues. I will conclude because Brother Muhammad Kibri asked me to speak to a personal story and maybe it's not needed. It's one of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you in your life to see 
One of your milestones in life is to be defined through your children, not through yourself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us and all of our families with the blessings of seeing your offspring, inshallah, become a fulfillment of the very da'wah, of the very blessings that we have lived in mass and beyond and in all of the communities that we come up with. But this is an infusion of what we hope and see for all of our families and for all of our, of our children's. We create these prototypes, inshallah, so that we can see them. We see a future that is bright and full of the energies and the powers of our kids and our communities. And when we see these projects, we dream beyond anything that we could dream today because we are dreaming of a reality that will not only accommodate and match the talents and the blessings of our kids and our communities, but rather it is made so that they can lead it into something greater. And it's made so that we can, inshallah, transform the reality we live in to a circumstance in which when, most, when people look back at the history of America, they say, Alhamdulillah, that America was touched by Islam. Alhamdulillah, that Muslims set foot on this land. And Alhamdulillah, Muslims have led our communities and led our societies to a greater America and to a better America for all. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and to guide all of us. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamualaikum everyone. I just felt like I listened to a, a president. I'm sure we all missed the f speeches that our current president does. Anyways, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, one of the things about legacy I want all of you to really think about, and one of the biggest legacy of our Prophet والسلام, he invested in is people, is the companions, is the love and the relationship that he had. This is one of the biggest legacy Prophet والسلام, left. And again, like I mentioned, everybody in this room is part of his legacy. I want to welcome the next speaker and I want to introduce Brother Nihad Awad as a civil rights activist who was successfully had led negotiations with Fortune 500 companies in Hollywood films and how to deal with Muslims, what are the issues and how to approach Muslim issues within the movie industries. As a representative of the American Muslim community, Brother Awad is a frequent interviewed in national televisions, Fox News, Fox News CNN, and NBC, anything that you can think about. I want to welcome the founder of CARE, and I want to welcome you, the nightmare of all the Islamophobes, Brother Nihad Awad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Respected brothers and sisters, jazakum Allah khair for sharing your evening with us and I'm grateful for mass uh, convention uh, organizers to allow me the opportunity to talk to you. I was asked to talk about a legacy and I was asked specifically to talk about my personal experience. I tried to shy away from talking about myself as an individual or my experience because we and I work at an organization, the Council on American Islamic Relations uh, an organization that defends the rights of American Muslims. But I was asked why CARE was created and what led to the creation of CARE and why CARE has been sustaining itself and has the presence, alhamdulillah, nationwide that has been recognized by the friends and foes as the most influential American Muslim organization and even has been, alhamdulillah, admired by other minorities and Muslim minorities in North America and in Europe. And I shied away from speaking about my personal experience, but I thought that maybe I should break that ice 
and talk to you with Allah's help why this organization was started. And probably the main takeaway from this experience and presentation that I will show you is a person like me who with Allah's help and the help of many mentors and team around me that made this organization the way you see it and feel about it. A person like me did not have the qualifications to start an organization. A person like me who's an immigrant and to the surprise of many people that I was born and raised in a refugee camp as a Palestinian. My parents were illiterate. They did not know how to read or write. But they taught us in the refugee camp the value of honesty, the value of being Muslim, the, ba the value of being honest and persistent and seek education and also feel proud of who you are as Muslim and not lose hope. Especially if you know a Palestinian or if you are a Palestinian, you know what I mean. You know what I mean when you see refugees with Allah's help who take advantage of their suffering and continue to build with Allah's help and support. I came to the United States as a refugee, as an immigrant in 1984 to pursue the field of engineering, which is a surprise to many people. But from the moment I landed in the United States and I started to pursue my studies, I started to be confronted by the media, by Hollywood movies, telling me every day that my faith is violent, that the Palestinian people are to blame for losing their own homeland, that my culture, my Islamic culture, is a threat to Western civilization. I could not tear my eyes away. Although I was a student, I was a community member, I wanted to do something because I knew that there's something that needs to be done. I looked around and there were no organizations that represent American Muslims on the national scene, whether in media or politics. Muslims counted at least 1.5 million. They are engineers, doctors, students, but no professional organization that's willing to be in the front line and to be ridiculed to speak on behalf of Muslims or to defend the rights of Muslims, although we did not speak on behalf of Muslims, but at least we reflected on how we feel truly as Muslims. I researched and I studied books like Orientalism by the late Edward Said, who told us in his book that these centuries old stereotypes about Islam and Muslims have been there, created by colonial powers to justify the dehumanization of Muslim societies to prepare them for colonization. That the literature in European culture, in Hollywood, has been designed to create the atmosphere and justification to mistreat minorities and subjugate them. The late Jack Shaheen, in his book, Real Bad Arabs, Real mean R-E-E-L, and he investigated over 100 movies, and he showed that over 100 movies have portrayed Arabs and Muslims as the three Bs, the billionaires, the bombers, or the belly dancers. That's how we were portrayed. I decided that I need to do something. Am I qualified? I was not qualified. Am I a journalist? I was not a journalist. Am I a lawyer? I was not a lawyer. But I needed to do something. So I learned. And with the help of my colleague, Ibrahim Hooper, who used to study with me at the University of Minnesota, he taught us as students on campus how to speak to the media, how to write press releases. That is science. That when we speak to the media, we cannot just speak with emotions. We have to speak with facts. And we have to be able to relate to people. And we have to educate people where they need to be educated. People have to be challenged when they need to be challenged. But above all, we have to be organized as a community. Could we do it? Well, we said, let's try. So we traveled to Washington, D.C. and started a small organization called the Council on American-Islamic Relations. People used to poke fun at us. 
that this will never go anywhere, that Washington will change us before we change Washington, that we will just be like other politicians playing games and not be proud of this faith tradition. And we decided to communicate with the media and we established ourselves and we started to send out press releases stating a position that we believe reflects the Muslim community, communicate with CNN, with the Washington Post, with New York Times. Over time, the media started to pick up that there is an organization there that's ready to give them information, not just complain. I used to complain a lot about the media, but I said anger, anguish, blaming the media is not enough. That will, change, will not change our image. But if we become organized, if we start to work with the media, slowly but surely, we will occupy our space. And we will not allow other people to define us. They have defined us for centuries, for generations. I believe today the American Muslim community, as you will see, is able and has been defining itself. We have defied the propaganda. And we will not and we refuse to allow other people to define ourselves. But that a journey has been long. It was not just a short days or few days or, or, or even weeks. Brothers and sisters, we were unpopular. And we might be unpopular now, but today we have an infrastructure. We have an organized, confident community that's willing to step up to the plate and recognize that this is a communal effort. It is not about individuals. It is not about egos. It is about the interest of the community. It is about the interest of the nation. The first case, the first case of discrimination that came to our office was from Quality Inn Hotel. A sister applied for a job with hijab. And after she signed the contract, the manager, another manager came and saw her in hijab and said, when you come back to work, make sure that this thing is not on your head. And she said, I cannot, this is my faith. And he said, you have no job. She walked away. She was fired on the spot without even working for one hour. She contacted an organization just she started to see on television, CARE. And I called on her behalf. I called the manager. And the manager told me, and he reminded me that this is America. This is America, that I have to wake up, that hijab is not allowed in the workplace. Because if he allowed hijab, he will allow people with yarmulke, and he even made fun of Indian Americans that he will allow people with feathers. And I decided on the spot to tell him, because it is America, I'm calling you. Because it is America, I'm pushing back on behalf of the sister. I asked him to retract and give her her job back. He refused. We issued an action alert. We asked the Muslim community to contact the headquarters. No threats, but be firm, be firm and polite. The headquarters did not pay attention. We held the press conference in front of Quality Inn Hotel, and we brought the interfaith community with us. A few days later, the headquarters issued a public apology on behalf of Quality Inn Hotel. That was the first, the first hijab in the history of Muslims in the United States. How many people responded to our action alert? About 30 people, and we could see. A few months later, a sister, Somali sister, was working at Jesse Penny, and she had the name tag with Jesse Penny brand, and she was just putting clothes on the shelves. A manager walked by here, and he was shocked that she was in hijab. She doesn't speak English. And he asked her to take it off, take off the hijab or cluck out. She was forced to cluck out, and she walked shaking for no reason, but because of her faith, she was fired. She contacted CARE, and we did the same. We contacted Jesse Penny. Jesse Penny refused to change its policy and reinstate her job employment. What we did, we issued an action alert. And we showed the community that you should contact this organization and demand justice for the sister. We held a press conference in front of Jesse Penny. The entire Washington DC media came and they saw a reasonable request that this job discrimination should not stand. Jesse Penny, when they started to see hundreds of Muslims contacting them, they realized that they made a mistake. They changed their policy, they apologized for the sister, and they gave her her job back. True lies, Arnold Schwarzenegger, 
he was the star of true lies, depicting Muslims and Arabs as violent. And who are we as care to fight Hollywood, a major star like Arnold Schwarzenegger? Well, we picketed. We picketed movie theaters nationwide, and they were forced to put a small disclaimer that this movie was not intended to defame or stereotypes Arabs and Muslims. That was a minor victory, but it led to many Hollywood studios who started to advance, give us an advanced copy of their script to look at the script and give him our input. One movie, one movie executive producer refused to work with us, although we gave reasonable demands, um, executive decision was the name of the movie. When you see it now, you see, it, you see the clean version, but it had many violent depictions of Muslims. We tried to negotiate with the studio, and they accommodated some of our requests, but we wanted them to change the plot line. They refused, and they were happy that we will do picketing, knowing that this will make them more popular. What they were they did not realize that care co coordinated picketing, but with leafleting, telling moviegoers the impact of the stereotype on average innocent Muslims. The movie lost $20 million in the first two weeks. And they got a lesson. And CARE other, and other Muslim organizations started to be consulted in advance. My brothers and sisters, the reason I wanted to share this with you, I was not talking about my legacy. When I wanted to, to defend the rights of Muslims, I was thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I, even without qualifications, I can step to the front. With, if I am sincere, I can work with other people. If I don't know, I will know. If I don't know how to do things, I will allow other people to train me. And I will put people in the right position. This was CARE almost 20 years ago. Today, CARE is a formidable organization because of the support of the Muslim community. CARE today has 35 offices, has 55 full-time attorneys. CARE today has 60 spokespeople, represents the interests of the Muslim community. And these attorneys are proud. Lately, CARE attorneys sued the U.S. federal government because it created a watch list that has 1.2 million people subjugating people and harassing them in airports, given this list to banks, who banks in turn, they will close down uh, the accounts of individuals, corporations, Islamic centers, just because they are Muslim and they give their money to legitimate relief organizations or just because they have active accounts. Without legal recourse, CARE decided that this de facto of Muslim registry should not stand and should be challenged. Well, it is the federal government, and CARE is a minute organization compared to the U.S. government. But we know that the Constitution is on our side. And many people thought that we are crazy, we will never succeed. Last year, a federal judge, after we sued the U.S. government, told the government that they cannot dismiss the case easily. This last September, a federal judge ruled that the watch list is unconstitutional. And just this past Friday, the judge ordered the government to fix the watch list. And the fight is not over, so stay tuned. Brothers and sisters, what I'm saying to you now, it is not really about just egos or our legacy. It is about us feeling that when you see an injustice, you should do something. If you cannot do it, but you have the intention to do it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will empower you to do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ Those who fear and love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will make it easy for them. So we committed ourselves to defend and represent the Muslim community in many circles without any sense of feeling down. Because of our beautiful faith, because of our beautiful constitution, because of the many friends around us. And I believe that the Muslim community is in a much better and stronger position today than ever. I know that you feel the pain. You see Islamophobia being empowered, being legitimized by the most powerful person in the United States, Donald Trump. 
He managed to divide the, the, to divide the country. He won on the basis of the vision and fear. But when we worked together with other minorities, when, when we stood by other communities, and we decided that we are not going to be scared, we're not going to be divided as Americans along any ethnic or religious line, we will not stand for bigotry. We will fight it whenever we see it. Voters worked for two years, and they managed to win the House of Representatives. I'm not talking in partisan language. I'm saying that we have to defeat Islamophobia, bigotry, no matter how powerful it may. It was designed to scare the Muslim community and push them to the margins, to the sidelines. The Muslim community did not run from politics. The Muslim community ran for politics. Historically, historically, every two years, about 15 to 20 Muslims run for public office. In the past two years, 350 Muslims ran for public office. 45% of them won seats. So my advice to you, brothers and sisters, stop complaining about the media. If you want to resolve the issue, study journalism. If you are a young man or woman, and be involved in making your own image. If you complain about policies and you want to be in the public service, why don't you plan to run for public office? If the most corrupt person in this country managed to win the White House, I think any of you can win any seat in this country. Young people who have interest in public service should consider running for public office to serve their communities and the country because we as Muslims believe in public service. And if you, can, if you complain about the law and injustice, study law and become a lawyer. Defend your rights of the community and other people. And if you are a parent and you already you made your choices. Let your children study what they like. Don't impede their ability. Don't block their vision or their dreams. If your child would like to study filmmaking or be an actor, let them do that. Because the Muslim community need to develop their own studios at the style and level of Hollywood. And the least, if you cannot do any of the Above, donate, volunteer your, your time, volunteer your, your services. The least is make a dua for others to succeed. Register to vote and vote. The Muslim community, brothers and sisters, in conclusion, is a minority, but is a privileged minority. We have access to influence, we have access to power, we can be influential, we can be powerful, we are not victims, inshallah we are victors. But also think about your neighborhoods, think about the Muslim world. What American Muslims can do here can change the world. So never act helpless, never think that you cannot do it. This is the land of opportunity but it's also the land of responsibility. That's your legacy. Salaam alaikum. Jazakumullah khair. I just wanted to say thank you to all of our speakers. MashaAllah, the amazing legacy they're living behind for all of us. Brothers and sisters, I asked you a question at the beginning of the program. If the Prophet were to visit you tonight, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what is the one gift that you'd give him? In his legacy, in his sira, we have learned that there's three ways to leave legacies. You invest in a building, you, um, you give donation, you have righteous children who make dua for you. I want to challenge all of you to push your children to get into the nonprofit world 
to become the da'i, to become the mentors, to become the next Nihad Awad, to become the next Abrar Omesh. Challenge your kids to get into these fields, not just engineers, doctors. We have enough engineers, we have enough doctors. We don't need that many. So let us encourage our future children and to get them into the nonprofit world so that way we can really establish our community development work. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of our speakers, you know, these guys, they live by what they say. They're not just speaking in here and inspiring, but they're also doing what exactly they say in their own homes. Dr. Isam Omesh is a proud father of Abrar Omesh, who encouraged his daughter getting into the politics. And mashallah, look at the success. Alhamdulillah.